waking up early, hungover, uh, enjoying your morning coffee with me this morning. Uh, we are going to talk about destroying evidence before it's evidence in quotation marks. And really what this talk is going to be focused, is, focused on is on some ways you can get in trouble both by the government and in uh, a private lawsuit uh, for covering up your tracks in, in ways that can actually be worse than whatever it is you're trying to cover yourself from getting caught from anyway. Okay? And really, we're talking about three specific scenarios here that we're going to talk about in some detail. The first is a criminal statute in 18 U.S.C. 1519 that's called anticipatory obstruction of justice. The second th uh, thing we're going to talk about today is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, our old friend. And uh, the third thing we're going to talk about are some potential legal problems with encryption. And then we're going to conclude with some suggestions on how you can safeguard yourself from being uh, accused of obstructing justice for deleting something or, or trying to cover up your tracks. And then at the very end, I'm going to take some questions. So if you have questions, I'm going to get to them, but let's save them all to the very end, okay? Obstruction of justice is one of those long-standing, well-loved prosecutorial tools uh, that can really be very uh, uh, malleable. It can really kind of fit whatever form uh, or context the prosecutor wants to fit it in. And traditionally, obstruction of justice has had typically four requirements. First, there has to be a pending proceeding when the documents were destroyed. Now, proceeding could be a judicial proceeding, like a criminal case or a lawsuit, but it could also be a congressional inquiry, like lying to Congress could get you in trouble. Uh, or it could be uh, an administrative uh, uh, proceeding, or it could be a federal investigation of any sort. So it doesn't have to just be a proceeding in the judicial sense of the word, okay? Second, the person who's actually doing the thing that is obstructing justice usually has to have knowledge that that proceeding exists. So if you've been subpoenaed to testify before a grand jury, and you, you have knowledge that there's a grand jury meeting, and you decide, eh, I think I'm going to delete these 10 emails they asked me about, you are in trouble, OK? Uh, third, there has to be a nexus between the document that's being destroyed and the proceeding. What that really means is that this, the item that's being destroyed has to have some connection to whatever it is that's being investigated to make it actually important, OK? Uh, if you are subpoenaed to testify before a grand jury and they tell you bring 20 emails that were uh, sent to you by John Doe and you delete the emails your mom sent you, uh, that's not obstruction of justice. There's no nexus between those documents and the proceeding. And last, the defendant or the actor has to act corruptly and with an intent to interfere with the proceeding. Your mindset has to be, well, I'm covering, I, I don't want them to find out anything. I don't want uh, there to be any trail leading to me. So I'm getting rid of this stuff for the sole express purpose of, of, of covering my tracks and keeping myself out of trouble. That's what traditional obstruction of justice, as we've kind of understood it, uh, has meant for many years. Uh, usually it's all four, okay? There are some caveats. There are different obstruction statutes, and, and I'm not going to bore you all with the uh, minutia of them, but generally speaking, if you're talking about generic obstruction of justice, these are the four elements that have to be met. Now, in the early 2000s, uh, Congress passed uh, a new statute called Anticipatory Obstruction of Justice. And this is a statute right here. It's found in 18 U.S.C. 1519. It's, it's kind of long, legal, dense, but basically there are two things that have to really occur here in order to be guilty or to get in trouble for anticipatory obstruction of justice. First, you have to knowingly alter or delete some sort of object or document or record. That could be an email, that could be a file, that could be a physical computer, okay? And second, you have to have the intent to impede an active or contemplated government investigation. Now, you look at this uh, lovely, dense, and, and the one thing that really stands out to me is right here. Contemplation of any such matter. You can get in trouble if you delete something that the government may be thinking about per prosecuting or investigating at some point, okay? This is a radical rewrite of the obstruction of justice statutes because it does not have many of the traditional requirements that we just talked about for traditional obstruction of justice. So let's talk about what is missing in the anticipatory obstruction of justice statute that 
we find in the more traditional obstruction of justice statutes. First of all, there's no requirement that you destroy something important. That nexus does not exist for the statute. It does not matter what you destroy. It does not matter if the government thinks it's important or not. It just matters that you destroyed something. Doesn't matter if you know of whether there's an investigation. So traditionally, like I said, obstruction of justice was hinged upon uh, your knowledge that there was something going on, that the government was investigating something, sending the FBI to go look for something, and you're trying to thwart that. No more with anticipatory obstruction of justice. There's no requirement that you actually obstruct an investigation. There's no requirement that the feds are unable to do their job without the thing that you destroyed. And all of this really kind of comes down to the real big problem with the statute is there's no requirement that there even is an investigation. It does not matter if the government was thinking about it or not thinking about it. If it's something that's in contemplation of being brought, you can be charged under the statute. And what's really scary is, well, how do we know what the feds are thinking, right? That's, that's, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're, you know, not, they're, no one is more forthcoming about what their future plans are than the government, right? So this is really a problem. And there's one case that really kind of illustrates this statute at work, uh, and that's the case of United States versus Colonel. And for those of you who don't know the saga of Mr. Colonel, I think one picture really sums it up, and that's <laughs> former Governor Sarah Palin. Yes, this is the Sarah Palin email hacker case. So let's talk a little bit about what Mr. Colonel did and how he got himself into some trouble. On September 16th, 2008, Mr. Colonel hacks into Sarah Palin's email through a proxy. He basically does this by guessing her password, okay? Uh, he does not employ any sophisticated computer techniques. He basically learns, because the New York Times published an article that said Sarah Palin has a Yahoo email account, uh, he then put in her email, said, hey, I forgot my password. And through uh, the beauty of Wikipedia, was able to answer her security questions and gain access to her email. Uh, yes, the, the world's most sophisticated hacker. At about one in the morning, he talks about this on 4chan. Again, you know, another warning sign that Mr. Colonel's not the most sophisticated of computer criminals. And at some point in time between 1 a.m. and 1.42 a.m., he deletes the images from the computer that he took through Ms. Palin's email. So basically what happened is once he got into Sarah Palin's email, he started looking around for really like juicy, gossipy tidbits, and he basically didn't find anything. Uh, I think he downloaded a picture of Bristol Palin, uh, and he uh, found some f emails from Governor Palin's sister uh, talking about family business, but nothing really that interesting or that important. Anyway, he still brags about his feet on 4chan, uh, but at some point he deletes the images off his computer, and then later at 1.42 a.m., a 4chan user tells Mr. Colonel that he's contacted the FBI. Now, that's going to be very important, we're going to see why in a few minutes. Um, undeterred by this, hey, I'm calling the feds on you, uh, he just then decides to post the password on 4chan, um, and then eventually 4chan deletes the thread, the Palin campaign learns that the emails have been hacked, uh, and then at 2.50 in the morning, Colonel tells a friend on Facebook that he's afraid of the FBI. Now, what's very important is this. At no point in this time has Mr. Colonel actually found out that the federal government is investigating. In fact, not until about 2.30 in the morning is anyone even really aware of what happened uh, in both the, the Palin campaign as well as within the government or the FBI or whatnot. Oops. The, the next day, on September 17th, uh, Mr. Colonel, now starting to feel like maybe he screwed up a little bit, uh, decides he's going to clear his uh, Internet Explorer cache. At 1 p.m., Gawker finally breaks the story, um, and the Palin campaign asks that anyone with emails uh, who downloaded the emails delete them. Uh, I should back up and say that when Mr. Uh, Colonel put the password on 4chan, obviously someone quickly you know, went in and changed the password so that Mr. Colonel himself could not get in any further, uh, and he basically lost access. Um, he reformats his hard drive on the 17th, then on the 18th he uninstalls Firefox, he runs a Windows defrag, and at that point on September 18th the FBI calls Mr. Colonel's father and says he's looking, I want to talk to your son. Now I put an asterisk there because at that point, once Colonel realizes that the feds are actually 
looking for him, he gives himself up, essentially. He is completely forthcoming. He cooperates. He meets with the FBI. He explains to them in full detail what happened. This was not a man who was trying to run away once he realized that there was something going on. As we can also see, Mr. Colonel's not the brightest guy in the world and, and probably you know, should have known, you know, could have done a bit of a better job in, in covering up his tracks. But nonetheless, the real problem in this case is that when, and I should back up, he was charged with a number of crimes. He was charged with identity theft, he was charged with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and he was charged with anticipatory obstruction of justice. And I would note that when he went to trial, he was actually uh, acquitted on the identity theft. He was convicted of a misdemeanor crime of computer fraud and, uh, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is the most uh, trivial of that section. And uh, he was, however, convicted of anticipatory obstruction of justice. And the conviction was based on activity that took place before the FBI initiated or even really contemplated an investigation. Um, it also he was also convicted on the basis of activity that took place before he knew he was actually being investigated. And again, this is very different from what traditional obstruction of justice statutes have, uh, have required. Um, I think a, a, a good example of what traditional obstruction of justice is required is like the Martha Stewart case, okay? Uh, you know, and, and kind of a classic example of getting in trouble for lying about a crime that actually wasn't really that much of a crime, right? Um, and in that case, she knew that the SEC was investigating her, and she lied to uh, federal agents anyway, and that's how she got herself in trouble. This is not what happened for Mr. Colonel. What's even more kind of scary is that the whole crime was based on Mr. Colonel's mindset. It was based on what he thought, not necessarily based on anything he did. Um, and we know this because what, actually, what he actually did was irrelevant. They found him in two days. This was not a tough crime for the feds to solve. They, they figured this out pretty quickly, and they got to him quickly, and they were able to piece together everything that happened quickly. And they were able to recover the data that was leaked out pretty quickly, and, and no one really suffered a whole lot of damage. It was a little bit embarrassing for the Palin campaign. Someone said that Bristol got her Blackberry taken away, and she was w unable to contact her mom for a day. It was really a tragedy, uh, but uh, <laughs> this wasn't the crime of the century. But Mr. Colonel got 12 months in jail. And he did that because, it was because of his state of mind. And according to the government, they argued, um, and they have continued to argue, because this case is up on appeal now before the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. It was argued in October, and it's waiting a decision. But the government argued that Mr. Colonel had an intent to impede because of two things. First, he had actual notice that the FBI was investigating him because someone on 4chan said, hey, I called the feds on you, OK? <laughs> Whether that actually happened, nobody knows. The government has never said explicitly in its briefs or before the court, when it was in the lower court, that yes, actually, this is correct. Someone, the person who said he called the FBI on Mr. Colonel actually did call the FBI. We don't know. But hey, if, if I tell you I'm calling the FBI on all of you, you're all on actual notice now, according to the government. Okay. <laughs> The second thing is that he contemplated he would get in trouble because he told others he was afraid of the FBI. Quick show of hands. Who here is afraid of the FBI? <laughs> and that's how a man got 12 months in jail under this very scary, very broad statute. Okay? So that's the first theory I want to talk about. Now you're probably all thinking it's all gloom and doom. Well, I promise you at the very end we're going to talk about some ways that you can protect yourself to avoid ending up like poor Mr. Colonel. But Let's talk about the second way you can kind of get into trouble for uh, destroying evidence or documents or files before there's really anything to get all upset about. I'll, I'll take questions at the very end, okay? And that's under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Now, this is a, uh, a statute that is, was originally designed to combat um, computer hacking, okay, for lack of a better term. And that's why it's called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. We're going we're gonna to deter people from stealing each other's credit card numbers and hacking into banks and whatnot. Um, and there are really, the, the main criminal provision of the CFAA that gets charged, or that you see pop up most frequently, is Section 1030A5. And it has 
three kind of different crimes that are basically varying levels of seriousness. So the first one is knowingly causing the transmission of a program, information, code, or command, and as a result of such conduct, intentionally causing damage without authorization to a protected computer. Now, there's a lot of terms in here that have very fancy legal meanings, so let me explain what they mean. A protected computer is any computer plugged into the internet. Okay? So it's basically <laughs> any computer. Uh, knowingly cause the transmission of a program. Thankfully, there have been a few courts have said if you press the delete key, that's not enough. Okay? But if you, you know, send a command to erase all the files on your computer, if you, you know, what this was really contemplating is, you, you know, you send a Trojan packet or you send something really uh, dangerous, uh, uh, whatever it may be, and you are destroying another computer, uh, any computer, effectively. This is what the statute was intended to cover. Another provision says that you intentionally access a protected computer without authorization and as a result of such conduct recklessly cause damage. So this is now like a, a less serious than the, than the very first crime because the first crime requires you to intentionally wanting to cause damage. The second thing is saying, hey, you recklessly caused damage. Now, you're probably thinking, well, hey, he never explained what without authorization means. Well, we're going to get to that in a second. And then the third and, and most I don't know if easy is the right word, but the, the least serious out of these three, uh, still serious nonetheless, but not as serious as the other two, is this last provision which says it's a crime to intentionally access a protected computer without authorization and as a result of such conduct cause damage and loss. Now let me point out, damage can be physical damage, it could be damage to your system, it could be monetary damage that you incur in trying to fix a problem. Uh, so if you spend uh, $20,000 on computer experts to get your network back up and running, that is included in the damage and loss calculation. Now, like I said, this was intended to protect uh, sensitive computers from uh, people trying to get sensitive information. Um, but it has been, the, the CFAA has been expanding. And if you go over to EFF.org, you'll see a lot of the work we've done trying to tell courts, hey, don't expand it too much. It's kind of crazy that you're expanding it this much. Uh, I'd also point out the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is both a criminal and a civil statute. So what that means is you can be charged for committing a crime, a criminal violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but you can also be sued by another individual uh, if you are alleged to have violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And the case I want to focus a little bit about uh, with you all is the case of Delati and Touche versus Carlson. And now this is the scene from Office Space where they're destroying the damn fax machine, I think it was. Uh, and, and the Delati case kind of is similar to this. Delati was a, it's a basically a civil, Deloitte. sorry, thank you folks. Deloitte uh, is a case where, <laughs> the Carlson case is, I'll be here all night, folks. Thank you. The Carlson case is actually a civil lawsuit under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And basically, in that case, it's an employment dispute case. And when I said the CFAA was expanding, where we're seeing a lot of expansion is in these employment disputes. So kind of a familiar story. Uh, Carlson uh, basically has an employment agreement with this company to uh, <laughs> you know, do work for them, and they give him a work computer. And uh, he eventually decides he's going to leave the company to go to some competing company. And so he's told, hey, bring back your computer. And he does. Uh, and when they receive the computer, they say, uh, what's going on here? The hard drive that was on here is gone. And he said, yes, I removed the hard drive because it had my personal information. And I took a baseball bat to it and destroyed it. Um, uh, but don't worry, all your proprietary information, I put that back on your servers. So I did not keep any information that was on that hard drive that I'm supposed to keep. At least, that's what Mr. Carlson said. Anyway, the company uh, sued Mr. Carlson, said he violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act because he accessed and destroyed information without authorization. Well, what does without authorization in context of the CFAA mean? If you go back, all of these statutes, all of these subsections of the CFAA talk about without authorization. Now there's some easy examples of what without authorization means. If you break into Bank of America's website, you are acting without authorization. That's pretty clear cut. But 
There are courts that have found that when you are an employee and you operate in violation of your employment agreement with your company, let's say when you get hired you sign an agreement, I agree I'm going to use the company computers for work uh, purposes only. If you act outside of that agreement, some courts have held you're acting without authorization. And that's exactly what happened in the Carlson case. The court found, uh, and this was at a preliminary motion to dismiss stage, so it, we haven't gone that far into the case yet, but it, they, basically they said as a matter of law, Mr. Carlson violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act because he destroyed this computer and it potentially had data, regardless of whether it was placed back on the server or not, and there was a dispute if he had, in fact, actually put back all of the data on the server. But the court said they had stated a claim under the CFAA for acting without authorization. Okay? So the act of just physically, physically destroying a hard drive constituted a CFAA violation. Again, this was a statute that was designed to what? Deter computer intrusions and, and kind of security breaches, not physical destruction of a computer. So again, that's another example of how you can get into trouble for really, b before anything is really there there. There were disputes, like I said, in the Carlson case regarding whether he actually returned all of the proprietary data. But the court wasn't really concerned with that. They said it was enough, at least, to survive a motion to dismiss on, under the law that he destroyed the computer after his employment had ended and in violation of his employment agreement. That was enough in and of itself. Scary stuff. Let's talk about encryption. Good old encryption. Well, unfortunately, the courts have not been as uh, susceptible to uh, arguments that EFF has put out and other people have put out about the benefits of encryption. And there have been some courts that have found uh, encryption is an example of a person obstructing justice. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, in federal criminal law, I'm going to give you a quick primer on federal criminal law. The way federal criminal sentencing works is that every crime gets assigned this number. And it's a number from 1 to 43. And the higher the number, the more serious the crime. And the way it basically works is they start with the baseline crime. Let's say you commit a robbery. Then they say, okay, a robbery is worth a 20. And then they'll say, okay, well, you stole a million bucks. Okay, well, that'll increase it to 30, and so on and so forth until you get to a final number that quantifies, supposedly scientifically, but I have my doubts, uh, the, the seriousness of the crime. Well, there's an enhancement, meaning a way you can raise that number up under federal criminal sentencing law for what's called obstruction of justice. And it says here, the defendant willfully obstructed impined, uh, or impeded or attempted to obstruct or impede the administration of justice with respect to the investigation, prosecution, or sentencing of the incident offense and the obstructive conduct related to the defendant's offense of conviction any relevant conduct or a closely related offense, you get an increase in your sentence. So it's more serious if in the course of committing a crime, you and then do something else to obstruct the investigation of that crime. Well, unfortunately, courts have found encryption to be obstruction. Now, this Wierski case, you know, as, as all computer crime cases is, is a child pornography case. Uh, and in that case, the court, you know, found that in the course of committing these child pornography offenses, which were basically distributing images amongst a group of users, the court found the following constituted obstruction of justice. Changing encryption keys, and I'm quoting from the, the court's opinion. Using sophisticated computer file swapping techniques requiring special instructions to reassemble files. <laughs> and using software programs that could lock down a computer or wipe it clean. So in addition to the sentence that these defendants were going to get for the child pornography offenses, the fact that they used encryption just in their computer system in order to kind of cover up what they did got them extra jail time, all right? Um, now, the, the, one, the one silver lining in this is going back a little bit to our discussion about anticipatory obstruction of justice, you cannot get this obstruction of justice sentencing enhancement for the underlying crime of anticipatory obstruction of justice. So that's good, okay? <laughs> but if in the course of being investigated for anticipatory obstruction of justice, you then commit further obstruction of justice, you can get basically punished twice for the same conduct. So be aware of that. 
How about encryption as a special skill? We're all special people here. Everyone here encrypts their computers. How about encryption as a special skill? Well, unfortunately, if you have special skills in the federal government, they don't like you. Now, this is another enhancement under the sentencing guidelines. It says, if the defendant used a special skill in a manner that significantly facilitated the commission or concealment of the offense, you get a sentencing bump. And the courts have said, hey, it could be a, a good skill that you have uh, that has plenty of legitimate uses. But if you use it in this way, you can get uh, uh, an extra sentencing bump. That means you get to spend more time in jail. And unfortunately, encryption is considered a special skill in the federal courts. So in these two cases, the court found because the defendants in trying to, uh, you know, d cover up some behavior they shouldn't have been engaging in, uh, used the encryption in the context of or in the course of covering up what they were doing, they got extra sentencing bumps. They got in extra trouble for it. Um, and then lastly, there's encryption in the Fifth Amendment. I'm not going to talk a, in a lot of detail about this. My colleague Marsha Hoffman talked about this yesterday. And I think the, the lectures are all up online. So you should definitely check out encryption, passwords, and data security. But in a nutshell, I think as everyone is kind of aware, there was this case uh, in Colorado, the Fricozu case, where basically uh, a woman had a criminal defendant had encrypted her computer, or was allegedly her computer. And uh, the government wants her to decrypt that computer or provide the password for it because they can't get into it. Um, and basically, she's now been put into this dilemma. She can either decrypt the computer and give the government all the evidence they want to use against her, or she can refuse to decrypt the computer and plead the fifth, which she has done and the judge has denied, essentially. And therefore, she risks going to jail for contempt of court. Okay, so this is another wrinkle in this that I don't want to spend a lot of time with, but uh, you should definitely check out uh, Marsha's lecture, and there's plenty of materials on this on the EFF website. Now, you're probably thinking it's all bad news, right? Well, there is a silver lining, friends, and, and here are a couple things you can do to protect yourself. And this is primarily with respect to anticipatory obstruction of justice, how you can avoid the appearance that you're anticipatorily obstructing justice. The first is a disclaimer. This is not legal advice. I repeat. <laughs> this, this is not legal advice. Nothing I say to you folks is legal advice. Okay? So don't say, if you get in trouble, say, well, man, that guy from the EFF uh, who couldn't say uh, that company's name or whatever, uh, he told me to do it and I'm relying on that. Nope. No. No, 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 no. This is not legal advice. Okay? But really what's important is you got to have a good retention policy. And it has to be coherent. You ha it has to be understandable as to what is to be retained or what is to not be retained. It needs to be consistently applied in every situation. It has to be routinely followed. And it has to be in place before and not after something happens. This is the best way to protect yourself because what this really does is it goes back to that crucial element in the anticipatory obstruction of justice statute, which is the intent to impede, okay? If you do these things, you have a great argument, you don't have the intent to impede. Because you didn't delete the documents because you were trying to cover yourself up. You deleted the documents because that's what I always do. I always delete the documents. I have this policy, and here it is in writing. Here is my policy. It says delete after six days, six months, whatever your policy may be. If you follow that, you have a great argument that you're not intending to obstruct or impede anything. And the same really goes with deletion and encryption, it, it, whether and in terms of like a deletion policy or how you encrypt. You know, if you, if you start to get yourself into some trouble and then decide, you know, today's a good day for me to encrypt my computer, well, that's going to be a lot more problematic than if I just bought a brand new computer and I'm encrypting it from day one. I'm putting in TrueCrypt, I'm doing everything in my power to protect myself from the minute I get in the computer. This eliminates the appearance that you're trying to act, you know, stealthy or sneakily. Um, that's not even a word, but whatever. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, there you go. Uh, like I said, I'll be here all night, folks, okay? So, and, you know, finally, if you have questions, feel free to visit eff.org. Feel free to send me an email. Uh, all my contact info is on the website. I'm happy to answer any questions in the remaining. Uh, we got like about 20 minutes or so. So, oh wow, lots of questions. Okay, let me start with you right there. The uh, contemplative clause. Can you slide back to that? 
Sure. Does that deal with the government's contemplation of an investigation, or is, does that deal with, for instance, my contemplation that the government might come after me for something later, so I'm going to encrypt it now? You're talking about the... Well, it's, it's weird, but it's kind of both, okay? What it means is it's, it's both what we call jurisdictional. It basically is how the government gets a hook because the federal government can't charge everything, right? They have to have specific spheres. They, they only get like limited things they can charge you with. So if you're covering up something or doing or destroying something that could be contemplated by the federal government, meaning it's something that's within the federal government's giant wheelhouse of bureaucracy, things that they're allowed to investigate, then you can get in trouble. But it also, the, the, the part about whether you think it's in contemplation goes back to the intent to impede. The intent to impede means that when you're deleting the document, you're saying, I really want to make sure the FBI doesn't catch me doing this. Um, but, like I said before, there's no requirement that there actually be an investigation or that you be aware of the investigation or that you even think it's probable that th there's an investigation. Basically, if you're really paranoid, and you decide, I'm going to delete this just because I'm paranoid and I think the spacemen are going to grab me or whatever, uh, and the spacemen work for the feds, you can get in trouble for this. Okay? Yeah? What is the new Massachusetts and future California PII laws? Pretty much state that all residents' data must be encrypted. Um, let's say for a company that has a lot of access controls around the stuff that for productivity, they don't encrypt the data. Um, what's the leg legality problem? Without looking at the specific statute, I, I couldn't tell you uh, without, without knowing the law. Like I said, uh, unfortunately, without looking at the specific statute, I, I don't feel all that comfortable trying to answer that question. But you know, if you want to drop me an email when the statute comes out, I'm happy to take a look at it. Yeah. Sure. Generally, federal criminal statute of limitations is five years. OK? Five years. So if it's like you did something 10 years ago, you guys are OK. There may be, there are exceptions to that. That general statute of limitations, sorry, let, let me put this caveat. The general federal statute of limitations is five years. That's not, that doesn't mean that it's every case it's five years. It, there are multiple exceptions. Some crimes have longer, like more serious crimes like murder. Murder has no statute of limitations, okay? Um, but generally it is five years, but I would put an asterisk. It depends on the specific crime that's being charged. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. That's a good question. And, and, and just to repeat the question, let's say you're forced to provide your encryption password and you uh, conveniently forget it, or you actually forget it. Well, what happens in that situation is this. Let's say you've been ordered. But we've had the fight over whether uh, the Fifth Amendment protects you. Let's say you've lost that fight, OK? You've, EFF filed the amicus brief on your behalf, but you didn't win. OK, now you go into court, and there's the computer, and the prosecutor turns his back, and you're supposed to put in the password. You put in a password, it doesn't work. You put in a password again, it doesn't work. You put in the password a third time, it doesn't work. Well, now what? Well, here's what's going to happen. The judge is either is going to have to make a decision whether you're trying to basically get around his court order, okay? Because, at, like we said, we're assuming that at this point you've been ordered to turn over the password. Then it becomes a matter of whether the, gover whether the judge, and it's really the judge, whether the judge thinks you're lying or not, okay? If the judge thinks you're lying, you're going to the slammer. Okay, you're going to probably be found in contempt of court. If the judge doesn't think you're lying, then the government's SOL. Okay, uh, but that's the credibility determination. And unfortunately, criminal defendants don't have a great track record uh, in cr of <laughs> credibility determination. So it's, it's a tough situation. Well, I, I will tell you that it doesn't work that way in practice. Um, so I'll, kind of a, a short answer is it, w it doesn't work that way in practice. I'll just leave it at that. And we could talk about that in more detail at some point. Yes? So regard to the, uh, the, the privacy compelled to give up the password, there's a clear Right. 
Well, again, let me, I'm going to first do a, a plug for my colleague who's sitting in the back. Uh, where is it? Yes. Uh, I'm going to, uh, the gentleman asked a question about uh, what the judge's thinking was in ordering uh, Mrs. Frikozu to basically turn over her uh, encryption password. And again, let me start with a plug that you could get a ton of information about this if you take a look at uh, Marsha's uh, lecture from yesterday. But uh, the short answer is, to give a little bit of background, what happened in that case was the government, uh, just so everyone's on the same page, the government executed a search warrant and obtained a number of computers. Um, one of the computers that they have a search, they have a search warrant. They're allowed to search that computer, is encrypted, and they cannot decrypt the computer. The government asked the judge to order the defendant to decrypt her computer. And basically, they've proposed two alternatives. Either she can put in the password, and they're not going to look and see what the password is, just that she puts in the password and decrypts it, or she provides, a decrypted con the, provides the decrypted contents of the computer. Uh, she raised Fifth Amendment. She said, I'm, I have a right not to self-incriminate myself. This would self-incriminate myself, and therefore, I'm not going to do it. Uh, and there was briefing, the EFF filed the amicus brief, and long story short, on Monday, uh, while we were all celebrating Jones, uh, the judge decided to sneakily, there, there's that word again, uh, uh, issue his opinion and basically say, no, I reject this argument. She has to provide the decrypted contents of the computer. Now, what his thinking was, there's a... Uh, a theory under the Fifth Amendment that says, look, the Fifth Amendment is only designed to prevent, to protect you from self-incriminating yourself. That's kind of like saying the Fifth Amendment protects you from disclosing the contents of your mind and revealing something to the government that they don't necessarily know. But if what the government hopes to obtain is a foregone conclusion, meaning they know it's there, they know exactly what it is, all that really is in the way is a technical barrier or some sort of roadblock that is just in form only and not of substance, then that defeats your Fifth Amendment privilege. And that's what the government argued in the Fricoso case. They said, look, we know there's evidence on here. We know it's on the computer. We know she's talked about it before. We just, we just need her to open it for us, and we'll be fine after that. And the judge basically accepted that argument and said, look, um, it's clear that the government has made a sufficient showing uh, that they know what, that there's something on there, they, they know where it is. Uh, unfortunately, the government has never really explained what they expect to find, and the judge didn't really provide any preview of what it is, but pretty much accepted what the government argued in its briefs. Uh, and, that's, and that's his thinking. Now, the only, there are two silver linings in the Fricozu case. The first is that it's a, it's a district court opinion, which means in the, in the totem pole of federal courts, it's, it's on the lower side of things. Um, so that's one silver lining. The second silver lining is that it was, that, that case is very kind of limited to its facts. Uh, and they were not the best set of facts. Um, and, and, and actually there's a third silver lining, which is the judge ordered the government to provide her with basically immunity in the sense that they cannot use the fact that she unlocked the computer against her. Um, and nor can they use the fact that she put in the password against her. So implicitly, there's a recognition that the Fifth Amendment applies to the extent that some grant of immunity is necessary. Because if the judge said no immunity is necessary, that would be implicitly saying, well, the Fifth Amendment's not implicated. She's not self-incriminating herself. And the judge didn't go that way. So that, those are good little silver linings for, the, for future fights on this issue to come. Yeah, way in the back. Well, generally, there's a provision of the law that protects a, someone who hosts material from getting in trouble for material that they've hosted, okay? Because they don't have any control over what gets put on. So that is, um, that is something that's at issue that probably protects 4chan. Um, there was some discussion in the Colonel case that, f there, again, going back to threads and discussion amongst members that, uh, someone told Colonel, hey, you know, they're going to have to report you. You know, 4 is going to send all this stuff to the, to the feds. Now, whether they did or not, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem like something 
that would likely to happen, but uh, nonetheless, that was again another argument the government used to say, hey, see, he knew he was being investigated. Yeah. So you have to, if you look at the CFA, now this is only one portion of the CFAA. There, the CFAA is a very long, kind of confusing statute, and it has a, a number of subsections and clauses, etc. This is one part of it. And what you'll notice here is you have to either knowingly cause the transmission of a program, or intentionally access a protected computer without authorization, or intentionally access a protected computer without authorization. Now, um, the intentionally access means you can't have your elbow slip and you accidentally hit the enter key as the, the virus is getting sent out. Okay, that's, that's what we're talking about intentionally. It means you have to send something. But if you're unknowingly sending over malware, you're likely not in trouble. Now that, I say that again, first of all, not legal advice, uh, but secondly, you know, there are, it's going to depend on the facts of the case. Now, let's say you don't know for a fact that there's malware, but let's say it's a really suspicious file and you highly, highly suspect it has malware on it, well, then you may get in trouble for recklessly causing damage if you didn't do your due, due, uh, if you didn't do your due diligence, try saying that five times too fast, uh, to uh, make sure that what you have uh, is not bad. Are there any other questions? I got the five minute sign, so I have a couple more minutes, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what, I think, sure, the question was how, how reasonable is it for an individual to have a retention policy? I, I think that's a great question. Uh, no, I don't expect every person to have a little uh, post-it note that has their individual retention policy. But rather than have a formalized retention policy, you can have habits that you get into. And that way, if called into question, you can say, look, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not a corporation. I don't have a retention policy. But my habit is I, I delete stuff after a week. I always do this. I always do that. I always encrypt computers right when I get them. And again, I'm not saying that this provides you with some miracle complete defense, but I'm saying this is a good way to combat uh, an, an appearance that you're intending to impede or obstruct. And you can, individuals can certainly have procedures or practices that they do uh, routinely or on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, that's a, that's a broad question, and, and let me try and answer it this way. Some data is more protected than other data, and the law imposes certain protections for some data that is greater than other protections for different types of data. For example, email. Okay? The contents of your email are protected under a set of federal statutes. And it's much more difficult for the government to get the content of your email than it is for them to get, let's say, subscriber information from AT&T that, hey, Joe Schmo has a, an account and he opened it on, you know, this day. So to the extent that the law recognizes that data is special, it does in the types of protection it gives to certain forms of data. Okay, that's it. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions outside. Thank you, folks.